I am having so much fun with the podcast this week. I love busting out the Brewer impression. I just listened to Conan O'Brien on Friday, dropped a bonus episode where he and Andy Richter and one of the producers of the TV show just swapped Norm MacDonald stories. It's podcasting at its finest, just people having a conversation. They told a story about Norm MacDonald's idea for a movie about Sully Sullenberg that I won't spoil, but I was laughing out loud, as the kids say, in the car. That meant I was driving a car, actually laughing, actually laughing out loud. It was so good. So I'm going to do some Norm stuff at the top, then do Late Night. Also, thank you, listener Lane Spurkus. He found a review of the Jon Stewart show. We'll get to that in a second. Let's start with the New York Times, who writes, Norm MacDonald's death came as a shock to many, but clues were everywhere. Death has been among his favorite subjects in recent years. In a great viral moment, Norm MacDonald delivered one of the earliest and best comedy club sets about the coronavirus. It was at the Improv in L.A. in March 2020. Norm said... It's funny that we all now know how we're going to die. It's just a matter of what order. At the start of Norm MacDonald's memoir, Norm tells a story about reading on his Wikipedia page that he had died. Then he imagines if it were true, laughing until a thought stops him cold. The thought, the preposterous lie on the screen before me, isn't that far off. The writer of the Times article says that seemed like jokey melodrama when he first read it, but now it hits differently. McDonald also has a bit about an uncle dying of cancer. I'm going to play the bit on this week's weekly comedy thing that will be available on the Live by Live app on Sunday morning. In the bit, Norm talks about how we describe people suffering from cancer as waging a battle, because that means the last thing you do before you die is lose. Norm McDonald said on Comedy Central, I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that if you die, then the cancer also dies at the same time. To me, that's not a loss. That's a draw. Vulture wrote about Norm MacDonald saying his impressions were not all magic trick perfect in the way SNL castmate Daryl Hammonds were. They weren't even the exaggerated abstractions of Dana Carvey. MacDonald saw things that were part and parcel of his subject's persona that others could not. His Burt Reynolds had no relation to the man's voice at all. It didn't matter. Because McDonald absolutely nailed the effortless swagger that made Burt Burt that giving no F's bravado powered celebrity jeopardy like a Formula One engine. Even if McDonald said Turd Ferguson pretty much the way Norm McDonald would say it as himself. From the late night shows, Seth Myers, an investigation concluded last week that a recent MTA subway outage that shut down 83 trains was caused by someone accidentally flipping a power switch, said one man. So that's what it does. Taco Bell recently started a program that aims to help consumers recycle the plastic from used sauce packets by having them mail those packets back. Trevor Noah said the idea deserved points for creativity, but probably wouldn't do that much to help the environment. Trevor, this idea has all sorts of problems with it. For one thing, people who eat at Taco Bell don't care about the environment. I mean, they don't even care about their own bodies. This is a weird idea, but what did you expect? Coming up with weird ideas is Taco Bell's whole thing. This is a place that will wrap a soft shell around a hard shell and wrap that inside a Doritos chip, which is delicious. But you really think their idea to save the environment is going to make sense? From Yahoo, Richard Pryor's widow explains why Richard Pryor's comedy still matters. The quote, now more than ever, we need Richard's voice. Time Life has a new box set. You know we're getting old when Time Life is putting out the ultimate Richard Pryor collection. Available exclusively on the Time Life website. Wait, does this mean like if I watch regular TV at 2.30 in the morning, there's going to be a half hour infomercial for the Richard Pryor collection? I'm so old. The 13 disc collection includes Richard Pryor's four classic concert films from 1971's Live and Smokin' to 1983's Here and Now. Plus, unearthed footage from his long-lost debut feature, Uncle Tom's Fairy Tales, in which black people put white people on trial. The set includes his famously censored 1977 special, two documentary films including interviews with his colleagues and contemporaries, and a bunch of deleted scenes, etc., etc. Jennifer Lee Pryor said, Martin Luther King inspired people and Malcolm X enraged people. Richard was basically giving the same message, but he was doing it with humor. In live in concert, he's talking about chokeholds and police brutality and people are laughing, but he's still delivering the same painful truth about where race in America is. I'm so happy that we can talk about the outcome of the George Floyd case being what it was. But again, Richard's truth is necessary right now at a time in America as we got this horrible pushback on voting rights, teaching race in school, and all this other white supremacist BS that is proliferating. He loved his films and the money that came with them. 
But the ability to be on stage and be no holds barred was where Richard really came alive. That was his medium and his favorite place to be. Jennifer said, Richard was a very complicated character, but he was so lovable. That's what I fell in love with the moment I laid eyes on him. He was just so open and he paid a price for that too. He took from his personal life so much. Sometimes I'd be having an argument with him and I'd say, oh, I get it. You need material. Jennifer was asked if Eddie Murphy sat down for any of this. Richard was a tremendous influence on Eddie. And if you play some of Eddie's material back to back with Richard Pryor, you'll hear a little influence there. Jennifer said, no, Eddie did not do an interview. He's been a bit stubborn, but I understand why. This is pure conjecture. But sometimes when people are right next door to their mentor, to the person who they're going to be compared to, they need some distance from them. I think that Eddie felt that with Richard. It was love, hate, not quite hate, but it was let me distance myself a little. He was always compared to Richard, and let's be honest, he grabbed some of Richard's stuff, but I think it was the sort of situation where he didn't want to be too close to him, you know? Dave Chappelle was also compared to Richard a lot, and Richard loved Dave, but Dave was never afraid to talk about Richard. The comparison wasn't identical to what Eddie's was. Dave always had a little of his own swagger going on, and of course his own show. I think Chappelle's show is in people's consciousness enough that he didn't feel slammed up against Richard. She was asked if there was a falling out between Eddie and Richard during the filming of Harlem Nights. Jennifer said, I don't think there was necessarily a falling out, but I think there wasn't the respect, perhaps. Richard felt at times that respect was kind of lacking. I don't think you can pinpoint any one situation or episode, but I think it was general feeling. If you think actors have egos, comedians have the heaviest egos. Of course, he had Red Fox in that era as well, and he was like the OG, right? Richard adored Red and played his club when it existed, so there was great history there. But sometimes Richard felt as if the honoring of comedy history was lacking in the younger guys coming up. Speaking of Dave Chappelle, Cincinnati.com tells us Dave Chappelle is moving forward with plans to open a restaurant and comedy club in his hometown of Yellow Springs, Ohio. According to a plan submitted by Dave Chappelle to the Yellow Springs Village Commission, Dave plans to open a restaurant, firehouse eatery, and a comedy club live from YS. Both will sell food and alcohol and have indoor and outdoor seating with separate seating for performances. Chappelle spoke at the Village Commission last Tuesday, saying he hopes the club, with its intimate setting, will rival clubs in New York City, Chappelle said, if we build this thing, I'm telling you, all the greats will come. So all week, I have wanted to tell you about John Stewart's Pete Davidson's 912 concert at Madison Square Garden. You know, the big giant all-star concert with people like Dave Chappelle. And I couldn't find a thing about it. I was starting to go down Conspiracy Road. People were like, you know, are you losing it? Are you doing too much of the Jim Brewer impression that you're getting to be a conspiracy guy? No, 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 no. Now, luckily, Lane Spurkus... One of the diehard Daily Comedy News listeners, I appreciate you. He found an article and sent it my way. I haven't even looked at it. I haven't even skimmed this. Even when I read articles cold on the podcast, I skim them. I haven't even looked at this. From NYULocal.com, the headline, My Very Biased Overview of NYC Still Rising After 20 Years. The subheading, because I just know you were dying to hear from a privileged 20-year-old, review a whole bunch of comedians. The author, Annabelle Dinda. Annabelle, I am in. Annabelle writes, and I'm reading this for the first time. I made the trek uptown to MSG for the concert, blah, blah, blah. And though I'm no seasoned performance critic, it was certainly not what I was expecting. The event was organized by Pete Davidson, John Stewart, all the proceeds were da, da, da. And from the looks of it, They're going to have a lot of proceeds to donate because the lineup was stacked, arguably too stacked, but I'll get into that later. The bill boasted all NYC-based comedians, but the term was used loosely. Some of the comedians were New York City born and bred, and other others just live in the vicinity for their convenient commute to their late night shows. Yes, I'm looking at you, Jimmy Fallon. All right, I like it. I like you, Annabelle. I like where you're coming from. Little sass. In total. There were over 30 comedians, 30, a comedian DJ who only played 90s family-friendly rock songs, and a delightful cameo by actor and actual 9-11 firefighter Steve Buscemi. The show lasted over four hours, and phones were locked away in pouches so we couldn't take videos. I hate that. Like, I get it, but, like, it's such a pain in the neck. The vibe in the room, if you can call a stadium that fits 10,000 people a room, was very casual. My friend and I were a sober Zoomer island in a sea of tipsy millennials. And most of the comedians were also drinking. There were endless microphone issues and a lot of inside jokes and banter. Several performers had no real set and spent their five minutes on stage being mildly charming or talking about their famous friends. This made me feel like I was in a small comedy club. 
When you sit through dozens of back-to-back stand-up sets, things become unsurprisingly monotonous. Every set began with a crowd-pleasing opener and ended with an introductory speech for the next comedian. Everyone had to tell their own tailored story about how Pete Davidson conveniently forgot to invite them to a show in which they were slated to perform, and everyone felt obligated to comment on the admittedly copious amount of mist surrounding the stage. Through the haze of forgettable performances, there were also some real gems. John Mulaney and Tom Segura come to mind. Hey, remember like four days ago when this podcast was all John Mulaney all the time and then Norm died and then Jim Brewer got uh, interesting? Oh, yeah, John Mulaney. I got to get back to gossiping about him. After taking a brief hiatus from performing, Mulaney, you know the deal there. I talked about it all week. Mulaney appeared even more energetic than usual, zipping around the stage while yelling and jumping in a wondrous and rare display of physical comedy. In the span of 15 minutes, John Mulaney gave the audience his drug dealer's address, did a very silly Al Pacino impression, and told a great story about wanting people in rehab to know he was famous. Interesting. Tom Segura had a much more subdued demeanor than Mulaney, but delivered far raunchier jokes. By the end of his set, he had me rocking in my chair, and I love him. Uh Uh-oh. The worst set of the night undeniably belonged to Bill Burr, who I really wanted to like but was soured by his commitment to an ignorant shtick. Unlike some powerful but still controversial comedians, not sure who Annabelle means there, Bill Burr's set read as preachy as he ranted about the failure of feminism and the insignificance of women's sports, both things he should at least read an article about before shouting at thousands of people, it's a comedy show, Annabelle. And I do mean shouting. It was almost as bad as when the DJ somehow managed to transition from Queen's Don't Stop Me Now to Ludacris. Dave Chappelle gave the final and the strangest performance of the evening. Only Dave Chappelle could arrive drunk 20 minutes late with just two planned jokes and get two standing ovations, the first of which came when Chappelle was introduced, only for Chris Rock to emerge and start stalling. But I mean, people were happy to continue standing and applauding for Chris Rock too. When Chappelle finally arrived, he made Rock stay on stage, so the last half hour of the show was a -a once-in-a-lifetime chance to watch two comedy greats riff off each other and make some deeply inappropriate jokes. Dave Chappelle would run around whenever he thought something was particularly funny, which added to the casual and intimate atmosphere. I've seen Dave do that, sure. He also smoked a cigarette throughout half the show, which was highlighted by an annoying neighboring audience member who kept saying, smoke's not allowed in here, behind me. Thank you, Mr. Whoever You Are, for your color commentary. At one point, following the removal of an illegal iPhone... Chappelle gave a very solemn speech about the oversaturation of videos online and how comedy is best lived in the moment. It was unpredictable and mesmerizing, carrying an extra layer of significance due to Chappelle's status as a veteran comedian. Annabelle writes, I have many other opinions and anecdotes from the show that were too trivial to include above, but for your reading pleasure, I've condensed the big ones. Annabelle writes, Pete Davidson is the dirtiest rich boy around. Next thought. I'm always annoyed by a Trump impression delivered by SNL alum Jay Farrow, but he saved it with a new Biden impression and his classic Obama. Gosh darn, if that's not the best impression I've ever heard. David Tell joked about all Americans being able to play the recorder a little and then promptly played the recorder. That's fun. From there, the joke absolutely disintegrated, but something about a grown man punctuating a speech by repeatedly playing three notes on the recorder is truly funny. Dave Attell live is great because he's usually just vamping and it's just a good time. Amy Schumer was much better than I expected, but I wish she'd stop picking the lowest of low-hanging fruit and degrading her own body. I think only Bill Burr would find that funny, and he sucks. Yikes. Wanda Sykes is always funny and apparently known Dave Chappelle since Chappelle was 15. Colin Jost wore a tight muscle t-shirt and talked about 69ing with Scarlett Johansson, and it left poor young Annabelle unsettled. She says, go back behind your silly desk and re-up your silly politically correct SNL contract. Colin, Jimmy Fallon should just not have performed. Hosted, maybe? But he sang a two-minute song about post-COVID New York and slow walking tourists and that weird forced Bruce Springsteen imitation he does sometimes. They could have at least brought Chris Kattan to dance next to him, but nope. Boy, I hate when people start breaking out half-ass impersonations. Those people are the worst. Annabelle, thank you for recapping that show. Let's see, John Stewart's story. I know I promised it, but we are running long here. That is getting bumped. I will leave you with this from militaryspot.org. Yeah, you're home for comedy news, of course. And they write, I'm going somewhere with this. Trust me. You got to trust me this far into the podcast. Militaryspot.org writes, in 1942, 
as the U.S. fought Germany in North Africa, it became necessary to develop a weapon that could pierce German tanks, rifle grenade launchers like the M1, M2, and the M7, and the M8 were used, but they were not completely effective as an anti-tank weapon. That same year, Lieutenant Edward Uhi was given the task of developing a delivery system for the grenade. He came up with the idea of putting a tube on a soldier's shoulder, say that fast, with the rocket inside. Uhi's tube design would give the rocket launcher its familiar name. Why, Johnny Mac, you ask? Well, at the time... 